argumentative polyps. The attraction to this has become has has been because of the recent emphasis on safety, particularly in the older population of patients requiring colonoscopy and those with colonoscopy with comorbidities. This so-called cold revolution um, is being driven by the safety of cold snaring, by the convenience and ease of using cold snare, and also by increasing evidence for its effectiveness. Cold snaring is virtually without risk. Any bleeding that occurs is trivial and self-limited and delayed bleeding only very rarely occurs and perforation almost never occurs. In my view, cold snaring is also safe to use even with therapeutic anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy. This is therefore very attractive to endoscopists, to doctors who are potentially concerned about medical legal risk, particularly in the Western practices, and also reputational risk where complications are rapidly um, spread around the town in which doctors work. And so these uh, benefits to the, both the doctor and the patient uh, are very popular. In my practice, I still use cold snare polypectomy even in patients who are anticoagulated or taking full antiplatelet therapy. You need to be careful with this and inspect the defect for the depth of resection and inspect uh, and ensure that, that uh, immediate hemostasis has been achieved. There are data on this which are increasingly solid uh, with more recent data coming out in the last six months from Australia with the use of clopidogrel um, uh, during colonoscopy with cold snare shown to be safe. These are the ESGE European guidelines on cold snaring, which emphasise the application of cold snare for both small and diminutive polyps. And really, this has been supported by the US guidelines and by other international guidelines, such that the current targets for cold snaring are really all lesions under 10 millimetres in size, including those that are pedunculated and increasingly virtually any sesulcerated lesion of any size. What about the evidence for small polyps using cold snare? Well, this is becoming increasingly solid. There have now been many studies comparing hot snare with cold snare, polyps up to 10 millimetres in size. Cold snaring is as effective, it's safer and quicker than hot snaring. There have been recent studies comparing cold snare for up to 15 millimetres in size, and there are further studies being done to compare up to 20. These are the findings from a recent randomised controlled trial published from the US uh, with uh, cold snare shown to be uniformly effective um, in lesions up to 15 millimetres in size with no adverse events and all cold snare resections 10 to 15 millimetres were complete. There have been relatively few randomised controlled trials, although this is changing and there are a number of randomised controlled trials uh, which are nearing completion or which have been submitted for publication. These three are the ones that have been published and they are a couple of years old. In my view, cold snaring can be safely and effectively applied to both diminutive and small colorectal polyps and increasingly to larger lesions. Let's talk about the technology required. So tips and tricks for choosing the snare. Well, preferably it's best done with a specific type of snare, a small snare because most polyps that are being used for cold snaring are under 10 millimeters in size. It's best to have a stiff wire that's not floppy and a thin wire is preferable to a thick wire because it cuts more cleanly. It's good to have a wire that grabs tissue uh, uh, effectively. And the other benefit um, of the dedicated cold snares is that they typically have a stiff catheter. So this combination of a very thin wire snare, a 0.3 millimetre thick wire, uh, wire snare with a stiff catheter allows the tissue to be effectively and cleanly transected at the tip of the snare catheter. There are definite differences between conventional and dedicated cold snares. Conventional snares do have thicker wires up to 0.5 millimetres in thickness um, and they are floppier, which are then harder to apply against the wall and achieve uh, a capture of normal tissue around the polyp. However, Michael Burke's group in Sydney has recently published this randomised control trial, perhaps emphasising that it's not necessarily about technology. It may just be important, may, may just be just as important to have, have good technique. And this study comparing thin with thick wire snares in 17 endoscopists, they achieved a very good overall incomplete resection rate of 1.5%, with an insignificant difference between thin and thick wire snares, perhaps emphasising that in the in these investigators' hands, the technique was what was optimal. So let's talk about the technique. The technique for cold snaring is fundamentally different because you must resect with a margin of normal tissue. 
You can see, um, see here in this lesion that there is a diminutive polyp being resected only two millimeters in diameter, but there's a quite a wide margin of normal tissue being resected around it. The reason for this is that you need to ensure histologic clearance when you resect diminutive and small polyps with a cold snare because you do not have the safety of diathermy to, to give you a thermal penumbra. This margin of tissue needs to be wide enough that you, because you do not have the electrocautery achieving a burn around the lesion which would ensure microscopic tissue eradication. Here are the stages of cold snaring. And for those interested, this was summarized uh, in a GIE editorial that I wrote a number of years ago where this image is published, just emphasizing the stages of cold snaring. And I teach this to our fellows, emphasizing the steps of detect, characterize, and then alignment and measure before actually removing the lesion. But I want to emphasize that point five or anchoring the tip of the snare, sorry, the tip of the catheter is the most important. So let's show you what I mean by this. This means that when you have a lesion, you have aligned the lesion uh, with the five o'clock uh, position of the instrument channel, and you have then advanced the catheter so that you have placed the tip of the catheter, the tip of the sheath, a few millimeters distal or beyond the polyp. This means that when you then close the wire of the snare, you will achieve a margin of normal tissue which stays within the, the snare wire. So you can see in both of these images, as you push forward and advance the catheter, you anchor the catheter and close the snare at the same time to achieve that margin of normal tissue. Let's show you some more pictures of this. Here we open the catheter, the, the snare over the lesion and advance the catheter forward. We then angle downwards with the big wheel of the instrument and right left wheel as well to angle into the wall of the, the colon. So you angle away and to the right and you push the catheter forward at the same time. This then allows you to then slowly close the wire of the snare without lifting the catheter. So the most important difference to, to hot snaring is that you do not need to lift the catheter as you close onto the polyp. It's important to continue to anchor and advance the catheter as you close the snare wire. This then achieves complete capture of the polyp. And then with closure, it's important to have your assistant continuously close the snare without lifting or tenting the polyp. This leaves a nice margin of normal tissue around the lesion. So uh, this technique requires precise control of the instrument tip and it has been emphasized a number of times in commentaries that actually cold snaring is quite difficult. It's actually far harder than it looks because of the need to have control of the instrument and control of the tip of the instrument so that you can place the catheter exactly where it needs to be. I also argue that it is helpful to be able to independently move the catheter during closure of the snare. And in my hands, this is done with the left hand scope grip where I use my left hand to hold the instrument uh, insertion tube so that I can then manipulate the snare catheter with my right hand. So this allows you to have a multi-dimensional approach to control of the instrument. You can firstly um, control the left hand, uh, sorry, control the insertion tube with your left hand on the um, angulation controls, but also with your little finger of your left hand, you can move in and out and you can apply or secure torque, which means that you've got independent control of the snare catheter. This then allows you to move the catheter and to, to uh, resect the lesion smoothly. So let's show you how this uh, works. So I'll zoom through here. So here is the stages of resection. So what we what we first do is identify the polyp and here we have a diminutive adenoma in the proximal colon that has been detected. We then characterize the lesion under narrowband imaging, which as we will hear shortly is a typical type two, nice classification diminutive adenoma. We then move back to white light and use the snare catheter to assess and measure the lesion. So I have already positioned the lesion so that it is at five o'clock um, in the angulation of the insertion um, tube. And here we advance the snare over the lesion and seek to anchor the snare. So here I push the catheter forward 
as I smoothly close. So you hear pushing the catheter forward as I close the snare. And then in one continuous movement without tenting, we can transect through and preserve that margin of normal tissue. Here we show another example with another typical another typical diminutive adenoma. In this case, only two to three millimeters in diameter as measured with the catheter. Remembering that the catheter is 2.4 to 2.6 millimeters in diameter, depending upon which snare you use. And then we align the polyp with the snare catheter. We pull back and open the snare and center the lesion within the center of the snare loop. So this requires control of the instrument. And you can see here, I'm just trying to position the lesion ideally right in the middle of the snare wire so that we've got a margin of normal tissue. We angulate downwards to achieve that and sometimes apply right left angulation as well. And you can see here by pushing forward, you've actually got blanching occurring at the point of the snare pressure against the wall. So at the same time, we advance the catheter and close smoothly and continuously in one maneuver without lifting or without tenting the, lead, the catheter. And then it cuts through cleanly. And then you can, without, if you do not tent, the specimen stays within the defect and it can be smoothly and efficiently suctioned without needing to go looking for the specimen. Here is another diminutive adenoma, again, another very tiny two millimeter polyp in the cecum. Again, type two, nice classification, diminutive adenoma. We measure and align. We position the wire over this, the polyp and we then capture and do not lift and retrieve the specimen in one maneuver. What about slightly larger polyps? Here we have a eight millimeter sessile lesion at the hepatic flexure, which again is a type two adenoma. It's a bulkier lesion that I was showing earlier and some may have concerns about bleeding, but the reality is that even for small polyps up to 10 millimeters in size or even larger, diminutive um, uh, bleeding is rarely a clinical problem. So you can see here, the technique is the same, advance the catheter, close and transect in one maneuver and you see there is no bleeding. To emphasize this control of the instrument tip using my both left and right hand simultaneously allows me to put the snare exactly where it's to be and to apply pressure to the colonic wall as I'm closing the snare catheter. Here you can see a good example of what I call the pivot maneuver. So here we have a small sessile serrated lesion in the proximal colon with the typical NBI appearances of pale appearance, lacy vessels and dilated open crypts. What I'm going to show here is the benefits of having control of the instrument. As you advance the uh, or open the snare catheter, you'll see I position the tip of the wire to the one to one side of the of the lesion, which allows me to rotate or to bend down um, and to fold the snare wire over the lesion. So you'll see this pivot or fulcrum or twist maneuver where you can embed the tip of the wire and then fold or twist down so that you then have the snare aligned with the long axis of the polyp. So you achieve maximum uh, normal clearance with normal tissue. And you can see as you do that, you retain the margin of normal tissue. So I think this just emphasizes the about, uh, amount of control you can get with good quality uh, uh, um, handling of the scope and positioning of the wire. I'm gonna cover three troubleshooting issues that are often raised with me. The first of these is bleeding. Minor bleeding is typical after cold snare. It's common and it almost always stops spontaneously. Even if it does occur, it's still usually trivial, even for larger defects. And in my hands, I think that cold snare a bleeding very rarely requires treatment. I do not remember the last time I used an endoscopic clip to control immediate bleeding for cold snare resection. You may only want to consider using a clip if there's continued bleeding in patients who are on blood thinners. 
So here's an example of some minor bleeding that may be of concern to some endoscopists, but I wanna show you what happens if you, if you carefully observe. So here we have a resection and we pull back and it starts to ooze. And in fact, it starts to ooze more significantly than you might be comfortable. But the secret here is to do something else. Go away and do something else. Don't spend any time worrying about it. I'm firstly going to just check that there is no arteriolar bleeding, which may prompt me to uh, intervene uh, more swiftly, but I've uh, very rarely had arterial bleeding from cold snaring because the arteries are much deeper within the submucosa and are typically not uh, uh, transected with cold snaring. I try to avoid washing a lot because you want the actual platelet plug to form. You want coagulation to occur. So I just washed to quickly check that there's been no mucosal injury, a submucosal injury or um, uh, uh, arteriolar bleeding. And now I'm just going to let the bleeding stop by itself. And so what you should do here is continue your colonoscopy. Go and do something else for a few minutes and then come back. So what we'll do, we'll cut away and we'll let the bleeding stop by itself. So we're just watching it there for a second. Here, here we have a few, a few minutes later. You can see that the bleeding has tamponata. There is now some submucosal hematoma that's formed. I'm just suctioning the surrounding blood, but there is now no longer any active venous from the defect and you can confidently continue the colonoscopy without the need to apply a clip. Cold snare cords are commonly seen. So this is the protrusion or white cord that you see as shown in this image here in the center of the defect, particularly in uh, uh, larger lesions or when you can't transect through the lesion in the first attempt. Uh, it is often associated with what I call cold snare stall. And there have been a couple of studies now showing that these protrusions or cords contain submucosae sorry, contain submucosa and rarely muscularis mucosae. But we really do not need to be concerned about them. There is no need to try and resect these cords. Um, we can simply move on. But it is a sign that maybe you had difficulty cutting through the, the, the polyp. So I want to just deal with what to do about cold snare stall. So this is where the snare won't cut through the uh, polyp. And it tends to occur with standard or conventional snares, but it still does occur with dedicated cold snares, particularly with larger lesions. And it occurs because of submucosal tissue entrapment. And the secret here is, is not, to, um, uh, uh, not to, to respond immediately. Just wait sometimes because typically the uh, lesion will often just slowly transect. So let's show you how to deal with this. So my approach is to avoid simply guillotining or repeatedly opening and closing the specimen. And I also avoid switching to electrocautery because I think that this is a sign that you may have achieved a deeper layer of submucosal entrapment and you want to avoid capturing the deeper submucosal arteries. I also recommend that you avoid pulling the snare into the scope because then you may lose the margin of normal tissue. And I'm also aware of some anecdotal experiences with people having complications from doing that. So I approach this in two stages. Firstly, I simply just maintain insufflation and keep the snare fully closed. I ma maintain uh, snare closure. And then I take some steps to maximize transmission of force from the handle of the snare to the tip of the uh, instrument into the tip of the snare catheter so that you try and gradually cut through. And often the snare will just gradually cut through. So let's show you what happens there. Here is an example of a small flat adenoma uh, seen here. And we, I'm using a thicker wire snare here, which may be one of the reasons it fails to cut. So I'll just pause it. So here you can see I have captured a little bit more tissue than I may have wanted to, and I am using a thicker wire snare. So what happens here? is that it gets stuck, but it starts to cut through. So the secret here is just to wait and watch and sometimes advance the catheter backwards and forwards. So what I'm doing there is just maximizing transmission of the force from the tip of the snare handle. And it will often just slowly transect as it does there for me without the need to do any other maneuvers. Whereas in this next example, I'm needing to move to stage two of my maneuvers 
which I'll show here, which is where I do partially reopen the snare catheter, but I don't pull back into the scope. I simply allow some of that submucosal entrapped tissue to be released from within the snare wire. So let's show you that. Here we have a very small polyp that I have captured just a little bit too much tissue with, and it's failing to cut. So we then just observe for a moment and keep the snare closed. And stage one manoeuvres fail to work here. So if I zoom through, what I'm going to do now is slowly reopen the snare, snare wire. So you'll see that I'm allow I'm, at this point, I start to reopen my handle of the snare. And you'll see that by doing that, I then lift the lesion away from the mucosa. And you can see that that, sorry. You can see that that piece of submucosal cord is being released at this point here. So you can see it coming away from the snare wire. And then at that point, I would then simply close and cut and the snare will typically just slowly cut through. And this is my approach. It only takes about 15 to 20 seconds of extra time. And it certainly avoids needing to switch to electrocautery or pull or tug on the catheter, which I think has its disadvantages. These videos um, are available online through GIE, but I'm happy to make them available through our Ambig website as well. I want to just finish by saying that because of the safety profile of cold snaring, we are continuing to expand the boundaries of cold snare to larger and larger lesions. However, at some point with larger lesions, piecemeal resection is required because of the size of the lesion. And this has led to the emergence of cold piecemeal resection or even cold EMR. The candidate lesion that we first studied for this was the cess ulcerated lesion, which had previously been um, a, a challenge for resection with conventional EMR and ESD because of the risks of perforation as shown here. There are also relatively high rates of incomplete resection with cess ulcerated lesions as was seen in the care study in gastro 2000. 13, where the overall incomplete resection rate was 10%, but cess ulcerated lesions up to 20 millimetres of the side had a 48% incomplete resection rate. There have been a number of studies in which there have been quite high rates of delayed bleeding with conventional EMR for cess ulcerated lesions. And so the idea of using a cold technique is very appealing and attractive to both the endoscopist and to the patient. We first reported cold EMR in 2018 with this publication in GIE, where we examined 163 lesions in 99 patients and biopsied the margins and showed a very minimal recurrence rate, no delayed or serious adverse events uh, and a very effective technique. And there has since been a number of other studies of this, but the technique is shown here where we have a very flat and very subtle SSL, which is injected with chromogelofusin or with chr chr chromic dye uh, to achieve a full lift. We then piecemeal resect the lesion in sequence from one edge to the other with a wide margin of normal tissue, emphasizing the need to visualize the margin of the, of the lesion with the submucosal injectate and sequentially reach the plane of injection and then sequentially work our way across the lesion and achieve complete resection. This technique results in some minor venous ooze, but I have not yet had a significant delayed bleed from doing this with a cess ulcerated lesion. The technique is summarized here and also in our paper where we dynamically injected. That means you lift and move the needle as you're injecting. You then aim to resect with a margin of normal tissue without taking too much. It's important not to be too greedy and don't take too much tissue with each bite. Otherwise you will result in stall and submucosal cords, which um, are frustrating and delay the process delay the uh, lengthen the procedure. So here is our video from the paper, which you can download from GIE. And here you see a typical large flat cess ulcerated lesion, which I'm going to characterize and then inject. So here we have an injection, submucosal injection across the full breadth of the lesion. Compared to conventional EMR, I tend to inject the entire lesion all at once rather than doing a sequential inject resect maneuver. This complete, uh, um, injection is much more efficient. And then having done that, we can visualize the margin of the lesion as shown here. And then we use a stiff thin wide snare 
to achieve a wide margin of normal tissue. It's helpful to reach the plane with the first injection. So sometimes the first bite is smaller so that you reach the plane into the submucosal plane. And then you can be much more quickly able to go across the lesion sequentially and cleanly and achieve complete resection. It's helpful to use the water in, uh, foot pump, the water jet to lift and to expand the submucosal space as you're doing this. Uh, and that's um, also very helpful with, with, some form, with, with other forms of diminutive cold snaring to ensure complete resection. So this summarizes where the first snare resection is often the most difficult because of tense and swollen mucosa and a stiff thin wire snare is helpful to deal with this. I leave the snare down the channel for almost all of my resections because it's much more efficient. And if you're using a large instrument channel, uh, a large diameter instrument channel, you do not need to remove the snare to suction the specimen. Key success factors in my view are to use a die for injection to, to identify the lesion margin, to take a wide margin, to not snare too much to avoid snare stall. And we do not convert to electrocautery or use adjuvant thermal therapy uh, because that would then potentially increase the risks of complications. Uh, several studies have now confirmed these results uh, with or without injection. Uh, and uh, having said that though, there have been reports of recurrence that are higher than our initial work. And these are the uh, most recent studies with recurrence rates that have been occurring of up to 8%. So here, this is an example of recurrence within a scar from uh, coal EMR of a ulcerated lesion, which can be managed endoscopically, but um, is uh, certainly higher rates of, of reported recurrence than we have um, experienced. And this may reflect differences in technique with uh, cold EMR. So, um, and then this is a recent meta-analysis confirming that cold EMR had a significantly lower rate of delayed bleeding with almost, um, with, with zero rate in this particular study of delayed bleeding from cold resection of FS SSLs. So I argue that cold EMR for SSLs is virtually about risk. Uh, delayed bleeding does not occur and prophylactic clip placement is not required. Uh, further research is required though on this issue of recurrence and some of the strategies that our group recommends for avoiding recurrence is to use submucosal injection to achieve a wide margin of normal tissue and to carefully inspect the defect and the margin to ensure complete resection. And I use increasingly washing of the mucosal defect with the water jet to expand the submucosal space to ensure complete resection. Uh, I'll just finish off here by saying that this is a, a, an example of inspecting the margin of the defect, inspecting for, de for, for residual tissue. And you can see that there's no evidence of residual serrated neoplasia. I won't go into this in detail, but other than saying that research is underway to see whether we can use cold resection for larger lesions, such as granular homogeneous tubular villus adenomas in larger, um, larger lesions, particularly in higher risk patients. And this is an example of a large flat granular homogeneous laterally spreading adenoma that I have used a cold resection technique for, and again, achieved complete resection endoscopically. However, this is still a subject of research and is of significant appeal given the safety profile. So just to finish, cold snare resection is now standard for small and diminutive lesions. Cold snare resection does require a different technique of advancing and anchoring the catheter beyond the lesion and preferably a different type of snare which reduces the rates of cold snare stall. Cold EMR is safe and effective for large cess ulcerated lesions, but further research is ongoing for extending the cold snare paradigm to larger and larger lesions. Uh, these are just for a further reading for some of our work and also some of the videos that I've shown are widely available and happy to share them as required. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak and for contributing in the webinar and I look forward to further conversations. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Professor David. Very silent uh, presentation. And now we have about uh, 10 minutes for discussion. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Harris. I'm Dr. P from uh, 108 Military Center Hospital, Hanoi, Vietnam. And thank you very much for the very informative and educational lecture. I, I have one question. Um, 
we see sometimes it's very, very difficult to approach and then call police located at uh, 9 to 12 o'clock. Uh, even, uh, even we already maneuvered the scope to change the position of police, but and uh, not successful. And in that case, uh, what is the, the suggestion or recommendation? Should we? Yeah. Change? yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. And so that is exactly the position that the, 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 the nine to 12 o'clock top left hand uh, part of the visual field is often the most challenging. And it's, it's very difficult to snare with the lesion um, up in, in the 12 o'clock position. You can achieve a long scope position sometimes without um, talking and positioning the lesion at five o'clock. So you can potentially push the scope in and, and achieve more of an on FOSS view. It's hard to explain, but you can push the scope in and, and have more scope in to then allow you to reach an on FOSS position. But that is um, sometimes possible. But the most effective thing to do is to reposition the lesion at five to six o'clock. Now, I know that sounds easy to do and clearly you've tried to do that and people do have um, struggle to do that, but it's, mo it's very important to, to simply rotate the scope and reposition the lesion. Now, clearly that means you have to have a straight scope. So the secret to that is having a straight instrument. You, you can't do effective and efficient cold snaring with a loop in the instrument. You must have a straight instrument, which allows you then to position the lesion at the five o'clock uh, uh, to six o'clock uh, axis to, act, to be optimally placed for the snare to be advanced. But I, I, I admit that some people prefer in this situation to use cold forceps, although I can't remember the last time I used a cold forcep for a diminutive polyp. I think it's far better to optimize your instrument control to reposition the lesion or to work a bit further away from the lesion. But actually the, 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 the key um, technique here is to reposition the lesion, work close to the lesion rather than far away, and to um, uh, keep the uh, lesion close to the scope so that you have very little movement. Often respiratory movement is challenging, and um, um, so buscapan or some form of antispasmodic can be helpful there as well. So all of those extra techniques are, are, are helpful to, but, but essentially it means positioning the lesion at five o'clock. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. There are a couple of online questions if you wanted me to answer the uh, the questions from, yes. from the... There's a question here about um, uh, dedicated cold snares. Are dedicated cold snares to be used always? No, not necessarily, but I prefer them because the transection is cleaner and quicker. But no, in some centres and in some countries, dedicated cold snares are not available. Last time I was in China, for example, dedicated cold snares were not available. That was three years ago. But uh, there, there's no need if you have good instrument control and good technique. But you, you do need to adjust the amount of tissue that you capture when you're, when you're using a, a, a different or more conventional snare. I would say you should never use a snare bigger than 15 millimetres to do a diminutive polypectomy. You must always choose a small snare, but it does not need to be a dedicated snare. The next question is about using cold EMR for resecting SSLs with focal dysplasia. That's a good question, and there are no studies to really direct that question. So this is about a dysplastic cess ulcerated lesion. Uh, there's no clear data on this, but I certainly, I do do that. I recommend resecting the dysplastic part of the lesion separately um, and, and initially. So I do the dysplastic portion of the serrated lesion first, and I try and capture a very wide margin of normal tissue or a very wide margin of tissue around the dysplastic component. And I send that part of the lesion separately for histopathology. So I think it's important to get a good tissue sample and to have a good uh, specimen for staging. Um, but uh, the, the uh, evidence is not there. And some doctors would recommend a conventional EMR to ensure complete resection. The other question is from Dr. Tan asking about does suctioning to collapse the lumen help when closing the snare? Yes, that's a good point. There is sometimes you have too much insufflation and the snare will not, will not grab the tissue. So sometimes a little bit of gentle suction as you close the snare wire will allow the tissue to fall inside the wire. That depends upon the type of snare. So I tend to do that if I'm using a non-dedicated snare 
which has more difficulty grabbing the tissue. Um, but that's a that's a good idea. And then the final question online is: Does shape matter? Not really. Although the round uh, the round snares do match the defect the um the specimens more often. I used to use Exacto, which is a, a shield shape, longer and more oval shaped snare. Also, the Olympus Snare Master Plus snare is is oval. Um, I I those snares are very effective for cold snaring. But it's about um, what's available in your centre and becoming familiar with your device and your technology. I don't think it matters that much, but certainly technique might just be adjusted if you have a long, narrow polyp and you're using a round snare or vice versa. There are all the questions from the, the Q&A box online. So if there's any other in the room, please go ahead. Okay. Uh... I think the, the time is, um, so this is the last question. Uh, in case the, uh, you, uh, uh, the gold snare only better me for the polyps larger 10 millimeter, do we need the supplemental injection or not? Not and necessarily. I, there have been several studies showing that you do not need to use subcutaneous injection for 10 to 20 millimeter polyps. I, I don't always do it, I will admit, because sometimes you don't have the, the injectate available or it takes more time to prepare the injectate. But I will always use injection for very large lesions. So lesions over 20 millimetres in size, I will use injection. But for in between 10 to 20 millimetre polyps, no, I think injection is optional. If you have it there and it's already available, I would use it. But it increases the cost of the procedure. The injection needle is 80 Australian dollars, for example, and the injectate's not cheap either. So I think um, it's often uh, for, for 10 to 20 millimeter polyps, it's better just to remo remove them piecemeal and use the water jet to achieve submucosal uh, um, uh, inflation, uh, submucosal injection instead of the uh, injection. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for a uh, detailed explanation. Thanks, Dr. Uh, now Great we'll to join you. Uh, the second lecture, uh, uh, Professor Ravender, uh, um, I'm going to talk about the new image enhancement endoscopy technologies and Professor Ravender Singh is now the professor of uh, medicine with uh, in the University of Adelaide and uh, director of gastroenterology at Lewin McQueen, South Australia. So uh, uh, Professor Singh please uh, begin your lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Young. Um, it is indeed a, a great honor to be here uh, to present these, these two uh, lectures. So I'll just uh, share my slides first um, and see if uh, we can see that. Uh, is yes. that visible? Yes, yes. Right. So thanks. Uh, it's, it's a great honor to be here at the NBIC uh, GI workshop. So what I'm going to do today is to uh, speak on uh, new technology on Im image enhanced endoscopy and its application. Um, and uh, I must admit that uh, the um, discussion here with regards to this new technology has not been published in uh, a lot of journals. So this is just based on uh, experience uh, as we have been using the system for a couple of years now. So uh, I'll just uh, start with saying that there are a few new technologies uh, which has been uh, marketed with this new system. And one of it is called the TXI or the texture and color enhancement imaging. Now what happens with this uh, modality is that the image is split into two different subcomponents, the texture and brightness. Um, and then these two different components are enhanced and then they merge back together uh, to, to give a more sort of a clearly defined um, lesion. So I'll, I'll show some examples. Uh, this is just an example of a video of a lesion, which is uh, probably medium size. And at first look, we would think that this could be a sessile lesion. This is located in the rectum. Now the TXI um, uh, modality is being switched on. And as you can see, there's actually a, a lateral ex extension um, with this TXI mobility. So uh, this uh, lesion is uh, more larger than initially expected. And uh, that's what uh, the, the texture and color enhancement of TXI modality can help us with. So uh, you can also uh, visualize uh, this better with narrow band imaging, which appears to be much more bright and clear, clearer. 
Um, as a result of uh, having seen this lesion, what we then uh, have done is to, to mark the lesion under the DXI mode before uh, removing it uh, using a, a piecemeal uh, EMR technique. So um, it is uh, it is it's useful to use uh, this sort of uh, mode if uh, we are studying the polyp in greater detail. So in this instance, as I said, it looks uh, smaller, but with TXI, we have managed to work out the lateral components. So that's helpful in one extent. This is just the RDI mode. And what the RDI mode does uh, is to actually enhance the vascularity. So it becomes more yellowish in color and the deep uh, submucosal vessels can also be seen. So perhaps that can guide us towards uh, uh, using the injection. We don't want to hit those uh, submucosal vessels when we inject uh, the lesion. We want to try to avoid them so that reduces the risk of uh, bleeding and things getting in the way when a resection is being performed. So um, th this is uh, how we then carried on with the uh, EMR. It's a piecemeal EMR and it, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, there's uh, some injection being put and it's all done under the TXI mode. And uh, a little bit uh, different to um, Professor Hewitt's talk, uh, we uh, had, well, we are using the hot snare here in this instance and uh, concentrating on that uh, bulky part of the lesion, which is important uh, to do, um, and uh, try to close the snare carefully as we advance the sheet, um, and give it a bit of a jiggle, as you can see there, to try to release some of the muscularis propria, which sometimes can get stuck, and then apply a corti to cut that uh, piece off. So given that it's a little bit more nodular, it's probably useful to um, separately take that uh, lesion and place it in a separate histological pot uh, for the pathologist to uh, work out whether there's any evidence of higher grade uh, pathology in that area. So you can see that the, the more flat areas are, are now going to be addressed and again, uh, you know, you can pivot the snare in different ways. In this instance, that doesn't work. Uh, it's sort of pushing the whole uh, bubble away. So we pivot it in a different sort of area, uh, carefully um, uh, closing the snare as we suction uh, the area towards us and taking a little bit of normal mucosa as we cut that. So uh, this was all done under the TXI mode, uh, this resection. So there are other things which has occurred uh, with the newer system and the narrowband imaging mechanism or technology has been greatly enhanced. So it appears to be much brighter and I'll show you some examples. And as I mentioned, the RDI technology is designed to enhance the visibility of deep blood vessels and uh, also to help with uh, the bleeding source. So what does the RDI do? It actually breaks up uh, the, the uh, the the light into green, amber, and red wavelengths. So what happens then is that the amber and red wavelengths can penetrate deeper into the mucosa and enables us to visualize the deep vessels and also bleeding points. So in this example, same lesion as you saw earlier, you can see that the RDI mode is now being put on. Um, and it actually uh, allows us to look at the bleeding source uh, maybe with, with uh, more detailed analysis as to the source of where it occurs. So you can see that it's that little dot over there and there's, uh, it appears more amber or orangish in, in color. Once it turns to yellow, we know that that ooze has actually stopped. So based on this, you can direct your therapy. Uh, this is not an overt uh, bleeding point. Um, you can direct your therapy in this instance with the snare tip soft coagulation method towards the um, area which is uh, bleeding. So that's what RDI can do and it's quite useful, especially with active um, arterial bleeds. There's also a couple more additional functions and one of them is called the uh, EDOF or extended depth of field, which allows us to not only look at lesions close by, but to also look at it in a distance. And a few other things which have come to the fore, including an AI mechanism, which I will, uh, I will touch on in the next talk. As, as well as um, the monitors which have improved. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go on to the next uh, slide 
show to just show you some examples of um, what we can uh, do with this uh, um, system. So uh, just a moment, I'll try to share this. Can, can you see that? Uh, not the PowerPoint yet. Okay, just a moment, I'll try to share it again. Mm. Um, all right, because these videos are quite large. Can you see that now? Yes. Okay, so uh, this is just a, a, an example of uh, the TXI mode, um, and I, I won't go through detail. This was uh, put forth with one of the journals. So uh, this helps us with detecting, uh, in this case, uh, what appears to be an adenoma. So the TXI mode is on, on the right-hand side. Sorry, this is actually in keeping with the SSA. Um, it helps us to, to look at things in, in a better sort of way. This is just another SSA, and you can actually see with white light, this is narrowband imaging, and with TXI where the texture is much improved um, with the sort of um, lesions uh, which, which appears to be SSL serrated lesion. But this is just another example of a lesion, and this in this case, this is in the stomach, and uh, you can see with the TXI mode, uh, actually the margins get enhanced much better this is an early um, gastric lesion which was subsequently dealt with uh, using the uh, ESD technique. We can also uh, use the TXI mode to help characterize things. Um, and um, uh, this is uh, just going to be an example of um, a case which we, we use the TXI mode in. Somehow it's just not moving. Um, I just need to end my show because uh, I cannot get the system to play. So just a moment again. I'm not sure what's happening there. I have to share the screen again. Um, just a moment, All right? Can you see that now? Yes. Okay. Um, all right. So that's and that's the yeah. Again, demonstrating improved visualization. Yeah. 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 So that's the uh, lesion, which is the gastric lesion, and then you can actually see the um, discoloration. So uh, in this other example, um, this is uh, a lesion which is again appears to be probably about two to maybe 2.5 centimeters in size. The right lower end is the TXI mode. And what we, we then do is uh, we can also define lesions with greater detail. This is obviously larger lesion. So we certainly will detect them with any mode which we use. But what TXI can do is uh, can also help enhance the um, fit pattern. So instead of using chromo endoscopy, I think uh, uh, the TXI mode uh, is able to define the pig patterns in much greater detail and help us with uh, the, um, calling the, the kudos pattern. In this case, you can see it's a kudos type 4 pig pattern. You can see normal mucosa um, as well as uh, the lesion itself, which has got this uh, brain-like pattern. Uh, and this is uh, using the magnification mode. Um, very clearly seeing it uh, as well. And in this instance, on, on, on this side at the seven o'clock position, you can actually um, see that the polyp is uh, occupying the right-hand side of the, uh, the view and the uh, normal mucosa is on the left-hand side. So that's very helpful with the, with the TXI mode. This is just another example of the RDI mode. And uh, this is a piecemeal resection being performed, and the RDI mode actually shows the vessels and, and the deeper submucosal vessels. So um, this is done in an underwater technique, and you can actually uh, see the vessels coming up onto the surface, and that's another area on the two o'clock position there. So uh, why is this helpful? I suppose, uh, in a sense, if there's more active bleeding, you know, as I mentioned, we can direct our therapy towards these areas. There's no necessity to put a clip here. 
the uh, what we should be doing is to uh, use this native soft correlation method uh, to kind of um, uh, cauterize or coagulate that area before proceeding on with the reception. So these are also fairly good views, almost like a volcano there of, of the uh, blood just sort of uh, uh, trickling down. And this is the um, RBI mode, uh, sorry, this is the TXI mode being used and you can see the blood vessels there. So uh, characterization is also important and th these are the last few slides. This is a patient with Barrett's esophagus and uh, this is an area which is dysplastic, which uh, is less than 0.5 millimeters and was picked up on TXI mode. Uh, you can actually see the patterns uh, sort of uh, not quite visible in this area here within a Barrett segment. So very small focus of uh, what appeared to be an early Barrett's adenocarcinoma, uh, which was resected using the uh, ESD technique. Uh, so in, 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 in our setting, we've got patients who've got fairly long Barrett segments, and sometimes you can find ulcerations within the Barrett segment itself. And sometimes, uh, as you can see uh, in this instance, there's also little areas which are ulcerated, which were a result of biopsies. So we do take random four quadrant biopsies. And the question then is, which area is the most abnormal area? So in this setting, you can see that the near focus uh, and the uh, magnification function is being used to try to define these areas which are ulcerated or, 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 or eroded. Uh, to try to define if uh, the area which is uh, uh, worrying is, is the area which we need to resect. So in this instance, you can see that this is an erosion and um, the pit pattern and vascularity is uh, fairly well preserved around the area, signifying that it's quite likely that area was an area which was uh, where random biopsies were taken. And this is just another example of an area where random biopsies were taken. Uh, of, of which the area is a non-dysplastic area. All right, you can see the vascularity and the pit patterns fairly well uh, visualized and well structured. Okay, so we are trying to find the area which uh, was uh, a hydrate dysplastic lesion or a cancer picked up on random biopsies. This again shows very good vascularity and pit pattern. Okay, however, as we moving the scope, trying to look at the, the area which we, we think is of concern, we can actually see that the uh, erosion is here and the pit patterns are distorted. All right, in this area, the pit patterns are not the same as the other three areas which was depicted. Um, and that's what the NBI mode uh, can help us with, with this newer system. It's much brighter and you're able to see the, the areas with much greater clarity. So pit patterns are totally distorted, all sorts of shapes and sizes, um, as you can see. Um, and that's that's one of the ways of um, picking things up. This is just another example of a patient with Barrett's where a random biopsies has picked up an adenocarcinoma. And uh, I can tell you that uh, there was a little bit of struggle finding this area because it was so small. So we found this small little erosion um, at uh, this probably measuring about 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters uh, within the Barrett segment. This is uh, now being uh, uh, looked at using the underwater technique. And we can actually see that uh, the area is a little bit distorted, a little bit better seen here on NBI. Um, and we just now going to slowly hone down to the area, try to characterize it even further. So just sort of uh, putting some water we use a transparent cap to try to capture the water within the tip of the scope and the cap and you can actually see very good views of an area which is uh, in keeping with actually an early barrett's cancer as well so such a small area uh, which was then resected uh, in a straightforward manner using an emr technique given that it's so small um so this is uh, just uh, other examples of where uh, these large lesions uh, can be defined, perhaps in a better way to remove them. In this instance, uh, uh, tubular villus adenoma uh, removed. This is just the RBI technique and the area was closed with a few clips. This is a fi final sort of uh, video of uh, 
a deep muscular injury. So um, it's quite important to use the TXI here because we again can see the flat extension. So the lesion was referred to us as measuring about 1.5 centimeters in size, but it was not the case. Uh, there was definitely lateral extension and uh, the plan was to do a piecemeal uh, EMR in this uh, setting um, because there were no abnormal areas noticed. But as you can see, and obviously this, this would also pan out with any of the other uh, modalities or device systems which we use. A piecemeal resection is being performed, um, but something has already occurred here and uh, I had to sort of take over the scope when this occurred uh, with one of the fellow, previous fellows, but you can actually see that there's really um, uh, a defect in the wall there. Okay, um, and then what we then tend to do is to um, close that area off. So a clip was uh, used to close that area from the left-hand side. So we were quite cautious to try to preserve the other areas because we still needed to complete the resection. So a clip was first placed uh, and then another. And after that, we carried on uh, performing the resection and completed the resection uh, in this instance. Uh, so you can actually see the, the end result. Uh, once uh, the resection was complete, we placed a few additional clips to close that defect. So uh, uh, this, this did allow us to, to see things with greater clarity, um, given that the definition of the scopes are much better. So in summary, uh, what these new technologies can do for us is to help detect, characterize, and to help um, do this with either the TXI mode or the EDOF function, to characterize either with the NBI, TXI, or EDOF function, and then to help with treatment using the EDOF function. And if there's bleeding, you can use the RDI function. So with, then I'll, I'll, with that, I will stop this uh, lecture. Um, I think we may have another lecture, but I'll leave it up to the chair to tell us what we should be doing next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor <laughs> Singh. And uh, we will have the discussion later after your second lecture. Okay, thanks, thanks, uh, Professor Young. I will uh, share my other screen now, and I hope this comes up. Um, can you see that? Uh, not yet. Okay, sorry. Um, So just give me a moment while I work this out. Okay, I think this should work now. Yes. Okay, no problem. All right, thank you very much, Eunice. So uh, I will go on and speak about um, application and clinical value of AI in, in endoscopy and healthcare and um, try to sort of give you an update on what's actually happening in this field. So current applications uh, in GI endoscopy, some of the issues, problems, and the future. So uh, AI in endoscopy has moved quite rapidly. You know, um, I do know from speaking to Eunice and Joanne that I think there's uh, probably a couple of systems available in uh, Vietnam right now. Um, and this is moving in a very rapid uh, sort of uh, trajectory. So we can sort of look at some data around what is happening in the realm of colonoscopy, Barrett's esophagus, look at some data coming up from uh, gastric lesions, as well as information in IBD and automatic di dictation of reports. So uh, with detection, uh, what has come to the fore is uh, this uh, so-called uh, strategy called CADE, right? So computer assisted detection, DE. So these are five RCTs which have been published and this is just a systematic review and meta-analysis of these five studies looking at AI in colonoscopy. And it found that interestingly, the adenoma detection rate of 
um, proceduralists who do not use AI was for 25% versus 37% of those who use AI. And there's other sort of uh, things which were measured, including an adenoma per colonoscopy rate, which was 58% with AI versus 36% without AI. And even Cesar's rated lesion detection was improved by, by about one and a half times. So this is certainly interesting sort of uh, uh, work being done. And the, these five studies come from all over the world, Germany, the United States, uh, China, as well as Italy. There's also a European uh, randomized control trial, which uh, looked at uh, about 680 patients uh, using this uh, mechanism called the GI Genius system. And though we think that AI only helps with improvement of diminutive polyps, in this study, they also showed that it had improved with even with large adenomas, about a 5% increment in the detection rates, which is quite interesting. Now, once these polyps are found, uh, we will be able to characterize them as what we would do in our normal day-to-day -day practice. So this is called a CADX. And uh, this is just an example of one of the systems which uh, we were involved with, looking at uh, endocytoscopy together with Professor Mori Kudo uh, and Inoue's group. And you can actually see that uh, the, the so-called endobrain also uh, tells you what the lesion is. In this case, that's an adenoma. Initially, there was a cancer. There's also some sound to it, which I've muted up. But this, as you can see, is a hyperplastic polyp. And the endobrain system is able to actually tell you what it is, a non-neoplastic lesion or hyperplastic polyp. This is what probably pathologists would see if they look at the uh, polyp on an end-on view, not, not like how they slice it. So CADX for diminutive polyps uh, have also come into the fray. This is just looking at polyps with typical um, NBI type patterns. So this group looked at 223 videos um, and validated it with 40 videos using uh, what's called as the AI for GI uh, technology. And they found very good accuracy rates of 94% but they did not attempt to look at uh, Cesar's rate of flat lesions. And there was a slight delay in the computer letting the proceduralists know what they're looking at. And about 15% of the polyps, the computer could not quite say what it was. So there are some issues and I think it's not too dissimilar to, I suppose, humans. So with CADE and CADX, uh, some of the things which have come to the fore is um, uh, the image detection is the AI fatigue. You know, there's a lot of um, unnecessary noise. When we say noise, in this instance, there's a lot of squares which come up um, and there's um, a lot of uh, sort of areas which are detected, which could be false positives. And sometimes towards the end of the day, people get fatigue and they just simply switch off the AI. So this uh, study looked at 40 videos by two experts and tried to see what are these false positives. So they found that actually in each colonoscopy on an average, they would get 27 false positive boxes coming up. So you can imagine um, if you're doing colonoscopies throughout the day, that there could be some fatigue associated with this. And they found that 88% of this was due to the bubble wall, meaning it could be a diverticle, clay, it could be an, a fold, it could even be the ileocecal valve, um, or bubble content, which could be debris, seeds perhaps, or maybe stool getting in the way. And they found that the proceduralists, these two experts needed about maybe in 80% of the time, they could work it out within three seconds that it is actually a false positive. But, you know, in the other 23% of the time, they needed a little bit of time to work out whether this was actually a false positive or whether this is uh, uh, something which is actually correct. So it does take a bit of time. And that, in fact, tells us once again that it's important to know the various endoscopic imaging I would say classifications and the ability to do them 
which I think Professor Iwate, Iwatate will tell us about later in his talk. So it's important to know because at the end of the day, you or we are the pilots, right? This is only going to help us with uh, detection and characterization. We also um, need to work out further with regards to how to differentiate hyperplastic polyps from sessile serrated polyps and how to differentiate uh, perhaps high-grade dysplastic lesions or intramucosal cancers from superficial cancers and from deep cancers. We had looked at this within our group where we worked out what's called as a modified Sano classification, um, breaking things up further from the traditional Sano classification into five subtypes, including the cisalcerated polyps, and this is close to 10 years old now. We had looked at all of our repository of images and annotated them individually, and then uh, did some data augmentation sampling and broke it up into training and testing sets. And we found that within a couple of months, the accuracies were about 81%, not fantastic, but this gradually improved to beyond 90%. And uh, this was presented at the DDW and uh, a biomedical engineering uh, symposium uh, with the AI people within our group. And then uh, later on uh, in GI endoscopy a couple of years ago. So uh, we found that uh, we can even use the system uh, with internal validation within the group itself or externally using different uh, technologies, including narrowband imaging and BLI. So there's also this concept that once uh, lesions are uh, removed, we need to assess the scar. And uh, these are just some examples of videos of, uh, of how uh, scars are assessed. Um, and again, I think it's important because traditionally what we are thought of is that we should biopsy these scars to see if there's any recurrence. But in this instance, if there is a mechanism in play, and these are all narrowband imaging with uh, magnification and the underwater technique, you can see three of the videos basically does not show any recurrence. But the video, which is on the right-hand side, lower down, shows that there's a residual adenoma there. And instead of uh, taking a biopsy, we should just remove it with a snare. So I think AI may come into the fore to assist us with this as well. So there are other quality or CADQ uh, sort of strategies as well, including looking at the bowel prep score reaching the end to the cecum and seeing blind spots. So once the cecum is reached, uh, this is some examples of uh, some work which we've been doing with the University of Adelaide. We, we got the computer to tell us that the cecum is reached and the bubble prep score here. So uh, it's, it's quite useful uh, sometimes to use this. And these videos are basically uh, not from our center, but this is just freely available on the internet. So you can see that large polyp obviously will be seen, but uh, sometimes um, uh, the system obviously gives us a bowel prep score. And what happens, as I said, is that um, this kind of square comes across a polyp. And there are various ways. Some, some of the other uh, centers may use uh, sound behind it. All right. And sometimes even smaller polyps uh, can be sort of seen using this. So the Boston bowel prep score is on the left hand side telling you how good or bad the prep is. And you can see a couple of small lesions coming up with those squares. We can also see blind spots and this group from China uh, very nicely has have demonstrated this. So they found that their system called Y-Sense reduced the blind spot rates from 22 percent in controls to six percent and what you can see on the left hand side here is fairly interesting as the scope is being progressed into the esophagus you find this color code of the stomach um, being done so you know the stomach is being color coded to tell the proceduralist that um, they they are doing pretty well but they could have missed in this case the fundus not being seen and perhaps part of the uh, area around the incisura so once uh, that is being visualized, as you can see there, then the color code comes uh, on the left hand side. So, you know, there's a better sort of uh, uh, area of coverage and to tell the endoscopist that 
they're almost done, but they haven't seen the funders in this instance. And so as, as they move along, uh, the whole entire stomach will, you know, and esophagus is being covered. So it's, it's a fairly uh, fantastic system to use, actually, to ensure that blind spots are covered. So with Barrett's esophagus, uh, this is some work which we have done and which have been recently published, um, looking at various retrospective studies. Um, there are about 13 or 14 of them now with fairly high um, sort of area under the curve of 0 0.94. With gastric cancers, the sort of work is more or less similar as well. You can see fairly good accuracies with the AI type mechanism beyond 90%. And in this instance, they also looked at predicting the invasion depth and the differentiation of gastric cancers using what's called as the endo-angel uh, system Again, uh, fairly fantastic uh, videos um, where you can see that the two upper areas are normal according to the endo angel system, uh, whereas the, the the video which is at the bottom here shows uh, what's in keeping with an early gastric cancer, and uh, the endo angel system has uh, look, looked at that, has called it, and also given a level of differentiation with the early gastric cancer, which is quite magnificent actually. Thus, the upper two videos are just what appears to be areas which are either depicting an erosion or some inflammation. So uh, if you need further information, you can uh, go on to this um, review, uh, which we have done together with uh, Professor Yu and Professor Ho. Uh, published in the JGH, and you can email me if you want further details with regards to this. In IBD, again, uh, there's been some uh, work as well looking at endoscopic and histological remission with fairly good accuracies, as you can see there. And, uh, you know, there's also something called um, natural language processing. So this group is fairly good. They looked at a lot of, uh, about more than 12,000 colonoscopy and pathology reports, and they try to see if natural language processing can improve the colonoscopy quality metrics. And they found that NLP actually was uh, performing similarly to a manual report. But um, these 12,000 uh, images or reports were looked at within 30 minutes by the NLP. Obviously, manual report would take days and days and days. So at some stage, we probably will have a system or mechanism where the AI will record the start time, the intervention time, uh, the time needed to uh, detect polyps, the polyp which we have detected, what type of polyp it is, uh, and then the end time. And perhaps all of that would be put into a report mechanism and we don't need to type things down. There are some issues and problems though, and one of it is called the uh, GIGO concept or the garbage in garbage out concept so if your data is rubbish but model is great you'll get kind of rubbish and the other way model the data is fantastic but the model is rubbish you'll get rubbish so we need to ensure that the the data and the model is right so with regards to an endoscopy a 15 minute procedure would need about 20 or would lead to 27,000 images, which is large amount. So we need to have a group, a good sort of uh, model of ground truth. So, you know, we need to know where the data is coming from, how was the quantity determined, who annotated the data with regards to their qualifications and training, whether it was single or multiple annotations and the inter and intra uh, reliability was measured. And how well do this training data match the intended clinical use? How many centers are involved? All of these are important and it's standard practice, just similar to what we would do with uh, our endoscopic driven research, right? The expertise of the endoscopies and the technology which was used. So sometimes we can use big data, data which is available out there. Um, and sometimes we can also use data which is uh, within your own database. There are a lot of free databases uh, out there, but we just need to verify their authenticity and how accurate they are. So with our own data, sometimes it's subject to bias, like th these are typical SSAs, and then this is a TVA, this is an invasive cancer. These are just videos which 
which are quite nice to use. This looks like a hyperplastic polyp, but as, as we go closer, we know that this is actually an adenoma. So these are some of the things which we need to feed into the, an AI system to help it understand how to differentiate things. So there's also trust and medical legal implications, you know, um, and these are just algorithms which we have devised looking at what if the endoscopist and the CAD agree on poly histology, and I won't go into detail with this, or if the endoscopist and CAD disagree. So one calls something and the other calls something else. And these are things which we need to work out moving forward. And lastly, incorporation into clinical practice, right? There are lots of images, but sometimes they don't equate to videos. There are lots of platforms, NBI, BLI, TXI, 180, 190, X1 system, many, many platforms. So we just need to perhaps make the AI system understand the differences between them. And uh, also, as I said, user fatigue can be a problem and cost you know, there's cost issues around these systems. And as I mentioned earlier in the talk, it's still important to understand the mucosal imaging basics because at the end of the day, we are completely responsible for the procedure and not the computer. So what the future may hold, perhaps we could use AI for uh, retro to, to look at missed lesions, but that could be contentious. You know, uh, we already made the report and then the AI mechanism goes and checks onto a video which was recorded two years ago uh, could, could, could be a problem. Uh, AI though could be used for flat polyps, polyps in the midst of inflammation in IBD to also track our performance, perhaps adenoma detection rates over a sequence or a series of time. Um, and also incorporation of AI into the entire GI tract rather than one person looking at, let's say, Barrett's esophagus or somebody else looking at the coverage of the mucosa with uh, AI in the stomach. We need to combine all of these systems together. And, you know, perhaps in the future, we could incorporate maybe biochip sensors, looking at the temperature, pH, maybe fecal calprotectin for IBD uh, with uh, visualization as well. So these are things which I suppose are things for the future. So I guess to conclude, the future is here. We need to embrace it, but we also need to be smart um, and, and uh, carefully choose what's needed and what's not in our clinical practice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Singh. Very informative lecture. And now we have uh, about 10 minutes for Q&A. Any question? Good morning, Professor Ravida. I have a question. Uh, I, I see on uh, uh, in, in our first lecture, as of slide, you use uh, TXI and RGI most yeah. for uh, characterization and the colorectal polyp and also for uh, evaluating the border of the polyp. So my question is uh, for characterization of colorectal polyp, do you see any superiority of the THI and RDI mode compared with the NBI or conventional chromoendoscopy? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your um, nice question. Uh, there's still a paucity of data with regards to uh, the application of these new modalities. From a personal perspective, uh, what I can tell you is that the TXI mode helps mostly with detection, not so much with characterization. It does help with detection because the texture and the color changes uh, and that can give us a little bit of benefit. In fact, we are right now embarking on a randomized control trial, which is almost completed. And we found that there could be an incremental yield of picking up more polyps by about 10 to 15%. Um, the RDI mode is mostly useful for bleeding, uh, not for characterization. Although there have been some groups who have looked at application of chromoendoscopy on RDI, 
but I think that's all just still experimental. So for characterization, again, uh, it's not very useful. For bleeding, certainly, especially if uh, one is faced with uh, an area which is bleeding and there's a pool of blood, and we don't quite know where uh, the source is coming out from. So in that instance, uh, the RDI mode, I think, can help us. As I said, what will look orange, or amber is where the active bleeding point is, and what looks yellowish is generally um, an ooze, which is probably going to be insignificant. So that's where I see these these modes moving on. But I can tell you for sure that there have not been any published data to date with regards to these mo new modalities. So uh, for the increase the detection uh, rates of uh, uh, suspects of uh, lesion, do you use the TSI mode at the, 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 the routine endoscopy or? So uh, we, because it's part of a trial, what we are doing right now is uh, we starting the procedure with white light, and once we reach the cecum, these patients are randomized either to a TXI arm. Or a white light arm. Uh, having said that, uh, I would say that we are all very comfortable with white light endoscopy. You know, we tend to want to revert to that, especially even when we remove lesions, we tend to switch it back to white light, uh, even with doing EMRs and whatnot. And I think it's mostly because of habit. All of us are very used to that. We've been doing it for such a long time. So, um, I tend to do that as well. Once I've detected a lesion, I tend to characterize it, uh, maybe with NBI and magnification if necessary. And then if uh, resection needs to be performed, I always switch it back to white light to do it. I think there are a couple of questions, or although uh, um, it, it seems to be more towards uh, um, resection, is that okay if we uh, address them, Professor Yu? Yeah, you can find the, the, some question in Q&A. So I think there's one question to say, hot resection after clips for uh, defects, um, is it safe? Um, all right, so I think uh, once there's a defect in the wall after we have put clips, Sometimes it's important to also understand that um, if a resection needs to be continued, it has to be done safely because we don't want to cauterize an area very close to the clips further. So what I would suggest is done is that if the patient is stable, the defect has been uh, seen, uh, we should try to resect around the area or take off the polyp around the defect so we can then close the defect very carefully and cautiously, avoiding adenomatous tissue within the defect. So I think that's important. Obviously, you have to ensure that the patient is uh, stable and CO2 is being used. Um, if there's concerns, then there's also the other sort of option to try to cold snare around the area, uh, ensuring that the clips have really closed the defect really well. So sometimes it depends on the situation and on the patient. I think the next question is after piecemeal EMR, is it routine or mandatory to, to treat the margins with a hot biopsy forceps or APC? So what we should now be doing is to use neither of these two methods, but uh, you have already used the snare to remove the polyp, um, especially if you use hot snare. Uh, and this is only pertinent to the hot snare, rather. So use the tip of the snare, it's called a snare tip soft coagulation method. Current 80 watts, effect four, with the tip of the snare slightly out of the sheet, you try to paint or burn the surroundings, uh, the edges, all right? That, that's, that's what's being kind of advocated uh, lately. And it has worked well. The risk of recurrence or residual polyp reduces to about 1% to 2% using that technique. And I think there's another question, characteristics to clearly differentiate uh, an SSP from an LSTG-NG. So these are two different concepts. 
Um, the the LST G and NG uh, is basically a gross morphological concept. So it is looking at a lesion from afar and trying to ensure that we've got the gross morphology sorted out, whether it's 1S, 2A, 2B, 2C, or a combination of the above. Um, so that's what the LST classification is. And the subclassification is whether it's granular, looking like a, what we call as a rice bubble type pebble-like pattern or non-granular, which is more flat, like a large uh, sort of rock, like AS rock, if you may, in Australia. Now, SSA uh, classification or, or characterization is different from the, those. It has got very typical patterns, mostly subtle in nature. It is generally rarely sessile, it is quite flat, and it's got quite typical features of uh, a mucus cap and irregular margin or indistinct margin. It also has got occasionally telangiectasia on its surface and an open pit. So these are some of the characteristics of an SSA. So it's different compared to, um, I suppose, the LST, G, and G classification. I'm happy to take any other questions, uh, Professor Jung, if there are. Thank you. I guess. Thank you very much, Professor Singh, because uh, times. Uh, thank you very much for the great lecture and very clear answer. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Now, now we move to the final lecture on the detection of the high risk blast and depressed poly and modification and BI diagnosis. Uh, from uh, Professor Mineo uh, Iwatate. Professor yes. Mineo uh, Iwatate is yes. a toxicologist. Yes, I, I can have the short introduction. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I can hear you. So, can you hear me? Can you hear my voice? Okay. Yes. Okay, awesome. Okay. Mm. So. I need some time to prepare my slides, okay? Can you see the pointers in my slides? Uh, I cannot see your slides yet. Can you try to uh, maybe share again? Okay. Can you show the pointer now? uh you have or i did not see the slide yet do you uh, did you choose the share screen function oh yes sorry okay maybe i'm sorry okay, okay i'm sorry okay okay sorry okay it's okay yes, yes. okay sorry on the banning Okay, can now you you can shell? Yes, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me begin. So, thank you, so Professor Hall, so invited me to the great international workshop uh, between the VFD and the AMBEX. So I'm Dr. Watata with Sana Hospitals in Japan. So today I like to talk about the detection of highest flat and depressed lesions and the magnifying NVI diagnosis. And I have no show sure disclosures. Here you can see the contents of my talk divided into two parts. So first, detections, and including what is the dangerous polyp and how to detect high risk fat and blast lesions. Then I'll move on to the magnifying and classification, including nice and general classifications, and also new simple magnification using the new technology EDO functions. Let me begin by the detections. Okay, uh, let's think. So, what is the dangerous polyps? So, the fact that it has uh, two first is a rapid progress to collect a cancer, and the second one is the challenging to detect. So, the answer for the dangerous polyp is the large, flat, and depressed lesions. Here we have the invasion speed 
based on the each microscopic types. So when you look at the protruded lesions and when cancer arising from the surface of the adenoma, the distance between cancer to some mucosal layer is very wrong. So invasion speed is slow for protruded type. But while the plus type, the distance between cancer and the submucosal layer is very short. So it easily embedded into submucosal layer rapidly and cause metastasis, right? And Dr. Kudo also reported SM invasion later of each macroscopic type. When you look at the depress type, so submucosal invasion rate leads 43% when the lesion greater than just a six millimeter in size and it jumping up to 73% when the lesion is greater than 11 millimeter in size. So SM invasion rate of depressed type was quite higher compared to uh, the other protruded and fat types. So we need to keep in mind the depressed lesions grows ultra rapid speed. Okay, so how about the flat lesion? Is it dangerous or not? Okay, so we call the large flat lesion greater than 10 millimeters in size, LST, lateral splitting tumors. So LST is subdivided into LST granular type and non granular types, and granular type composed of small or large nodules. And it's easier to detect because of region sickness, while LST non granular type is completely flat, so it's literally hard to detect. And when we look at the SM invasion rate of LST granular and non granular types, so SM invasion rate of LST non granular type is greater than 40% when the lesion is greater than 2 cm and it jump up to 100% if the region over 3 cm. So among flat lesions, LST energy is the high risk lesions. It's like uh, depressed lesions. Okay, here we see the post colonoscopy collective cancer at early stage following a previous negative colonoscopy within three years detected at Sana Hospital since 2010 to 18th. So among eight cases, two cases are were recurrence by piecemeal resection. But the other six cases were uh, considered to be overlooked. And of these six cases, interestingly, the macroscopic type shows the plus type or LST non granular type, and the, the size is greater than one centimeter. So if you missed small tiny polyp of the adenoma, I think it's not a big deal because you will be able to detect it at the next surveillance colonoscopy as under the normals. But if you miss depressed or LST non ground type lesions at the initial colonoscopy, next time they will come back as a collector cancer. Maybe it's a fatal collector cancer. So we need to pay more attention to these depressed and LST non glandular types. Okay, but someone may think so flat and depressed lesions are very rare regions or Japanese specific lesions? Okay, the answer is no, because the uh, later fat and depressed lesions was similar between the east and the west. So you would miss the fat and depressed lesion because of, uh, not because of low prevalence. Okay, I will show you one cases because fat and depressed lesion is hard to detect. So there is a flat polyp LST non granular top two centimeter hidden in this white light image. So can you detect your flat polyp in this white light image? So if you did, if you can detect, please raise your hand. Actually, this is the most difficult cases I have ever experienced for LST non granular types. Okay, is there anyone? Raise your hand. No? Okay, so here. So the chrome endoscopy uh, clearly shows the margin of the flat LRC non granular type. So this LRC non granular type is very really hard to detect because of the subtle morphologies. Okay, so 
I'd like to define high-risk fatty and depressed lesions, uh, including the LST, non-granular type, and depressed type, and additionally, large SSLs. Because a uh, large SSL is a completed fat lesion and the higher risk of uh, uh, to be a large Saturday interval corrector cancer. So we define the, these three subtypes of this lesion as high risk fat and depressed lesions in my talk. Okay, next, I'm gonna talk about how to detect high risk fat and depressed lesions. Okay, so increasing detection letter of fat and depressed lesion is now crucial. But how do we do it? Okay, so at first sight, we hardly notice their whole existence, but we can just notice clues for them more easily. Okay, so I introduced uh, four key clues by wildlife measures, including fold deformations, intensive stool mucus attachment, and no vessel visibilities, and finally, demarcated lattice area. So taking the first letter, F, I and the find will help you memorize for these findings. Okay, so we we have made the education video for learning the find clues, so you can freely access through this link. So I'll share the some contents of education videos with you. Again, it's key clue one is the demarcated lattice area. And demarcated lattice area is have divided into whole lattice type and the marginal lattice types. And the whole radius type is the main pattern of the LST and granular type, while marginal radius type is for the depressed lesions. And don't miss this key clue of the simple information. This is a very important key clue to detect the fat and depressed lesions. Okay, so as for whole radish types, so you can see the reddish area here, here in these two images like this. But you don't miss, you never miss these findings as a simple information. This is a very important findings to detect fat and depressed lesions. And additional chrome endoscopy and NBI uh, can confirm that they are neoplasia, elastin on granular types. And the part airway, 67% of the depressed lesion shows a marginal lattice type. We call this O-ring sign. This is very effective for detect, especially for depressed type. Okay, so key clue two is the no vessel visibilities. Okay, so here need some flat lesions. And when some flat lesion located in the vessel visibility in the background of mucosa. So this fat lesion masks the vessel visibility in the background mucosa. So when we find the area of no vessel visibility, we should suspect there might be a flat lesion here. This is a very important findings to detect fat and vessel lesions. Okay, this is question one. Can you find what shape is masked in this image. I'll give you 15 seconds. Okay, so what shape is masked? This is a training for your brain. Okay, can you find? Someone may, okay. If you understand. And, uh... Yes, okay, that's right. Because you were experts, that sounds good. Okay, so, but, if you don't, uh, if you couldn't an answer this question correctly, it's not big deal because it's enough. You should notice there is someone, something hiding the best visibility. It's enough because additional chrome endoscopy or NVI will help you uh, detect the whole margin of this lesion. Okay, this is a question too. So, can you follow the margin of a flat lesion in this images? So please move your eyes from outside to
issue inside like this with the confirming the best visibility. So here we can see the best visibility. Here we can see the best visibility, so visible. But here we cannot see the best visibility well. And here also. So the place uh, where best visibility changes from visible to invisible is the margin of this flat region. So here, okay, like this, please trace the margin of this region collectories. So outside to inside and the visible area to no invisible area. So please trace the margin of this region accurately. So here, 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 right? Like this. We can detect flat lesion by only by wildlife imaging. This is the flat three centimeter lesion elevation on glonial types. And also, chromandoscopy uh, can also reveal this elevation on glonial type clearly. Okay, so I'd like to stress the uh, best visibility depends on the amount of pooled air. Because so, vessel visibility becomes worse as the pool the air decays. So, we need to uh, inflate enough air when we see the vessel visibility in routine chronoscopies. Okay, so TXI Professor Laji talked to us would be useful because it can enhance vessel visibility, visibility in background mucosa. So TXI may be better than what I imagined. Okay, so this is key clue three, intensive stool mucus attachment. As you know, SSL produce much mucus on it like this, and this traps the stools like this. And the stool is accumulated on the whole or on the marginally. And please memorize don't miss this key clue considered as uh, poor populations. This is a very important key clue to detect especially sister selected lesions. Okay, this is the question slave. Can you find the SSL here in this images? Yes. Okay, you can see this true accumulation here like this. Okay, this is a key sign to detect SSL. After watching their mucus and the stools, actually, so SSL becomes worse in the detection, but the chromendoscopy uh, reveal the SSL very clearly. Okay, how about this lesion? Where is SSL? Okay, but uh, we can already notice there is a stool like this. So this tool attached marginally. So, and the best visibility inside this area so becomes worse. So we need to notice that there may be something here, right? So, chromendoscopy I uh, can show the SSL very very clearly. Okay, finally, uh, Kiklo fall at the. For the deformations, here we have the outline of a colorectal fold from lateral views. So some flat lesions, especially LFC non granular type, is on their fold and cause fold deformation. The main pattern of the fold deformations are deep carp and the irregular webbing or elevated outlines. Okay, so can you find the abnormal outline of the fold in these images? It's very easy. Because so if we can see the outline of the normal fold from the left side, the outline deeply fold in this area. So we need to notice there may be something on the fold. And when we see the outline of the normal fold from the right side, so the outline is elevated here, suggesting that this uh, some flat lesion extended to here. And chromendoscopy uh, clearly show the allerstein and this type on the fold like this. 
And how about this legend, question six. So can you find the abnormal outline of the fold? When we look at the outline from the rest side, so elevated, it is elevated here and waving. So we need to notice there may be some flat lesions on the fold. And please follow the margin of this flat lesion using the key clue to novice visibilities from outside to inside. Please follow the margin of this flat lesions. Here, here, like this. So this lesion is over five centimeters, very big flat lesion is hidden in this image. So chrome endoscopy uh, clearly show the arresting and granular top on the fold like this. Okay, so now I'll introduce the uh, AMBEC International Randomized Control Trial called the CATCH Project. And our clinical questionnaire's online indication on the find clue is effective or not for young Asian endoscopists from certain Asian countries. And I'd like to thank Professor Quantron Duck for his uh, dedicated support to this project. And 284 Asian endos endoscopists with their clinical experience less than 10 years were randomized into non-education group and education group. And both of them take uh, two image laden tests, pre-test and post-test. And the six images, including 45 in the blast region and the five polypart and 15 uh, regions. And they answered whether there is a polyp or not uh, after uh, leading the stellar images. And education group, only education group can receive the, uh, could receive self-education short programs. And the primary outcome is the change in the detection rate for high risk fat and deep blast lesions. And our online self education program included the educational video for 15 minutes. I have talked, yes, uh, in my talks. And the, the other one is the 20 self running QA for about 25 minutes. So, totally, it takes about 40 minutes, very short education time. Here you see the main, uh, here you see the results. So, so 139 education group and 139 education group was finally analyzed. And there was no significant dif difference between these groups. And around 20 participants from each country were registered. Uh, of course, from Vietnam. So 21 participants were registered. Thank you so much to complete this project. And this is the main result of detection rate. When you look at the red box, the detection rate of Fred and the best lesions was significantly uh, higher. And so the pretest at the 66%, but the post-test was 81%, so significantly increased, but not in the non-education groups. And similarly, so uh, detection rate of LST energy, the blast lesion, large SSS, uh, is was well, significantly higher only in the education globe. So, the, this is my conclusion. So, education on the find the clue was effective for Asian endoscopists in the detection rate of high risk fat and the blast lesions. Okay, then finally, I'll move on to the magnifying and the classifications. Here we see the NVI International Collector classification, nice classifications. This classification has three components, the color, basal, and surface pattern, and divided into three categories, type one, two, three. And type one is indicator of a hyperplastic and cessor selective lesions. Type 2 indicating adenomas requires endoscopic resection. And type 3 is an indicator of deep sum causal invasive cancers, which requires surgeries. And Professor Hewitt uh, first reported in gastroenterology 10 years ago. And uh, I think this question is the most popular in the world. And the uh, advantage of the, this question is uh, available without 
magnification. But uh, there is a one problem with the nice two category for Japanese endoscopist because um, this nice type two category include various histology from benign low grade adenoma to malignant high grade adenoma and some causal cancers. So these two uh, categories should be divided separately because uh, treatment option is different. So for benign polyp, we need to resect them at the polypectomies and piecemeal resection will be acceptable. However, for malignant polyps, so we should resect at the as the end block deep resections, such as EML ESD for estimating the invasion depth collectory. So that's why Japanese experts need the type two category divided into two N and two Vs. So this is the Jana classification developed in 2014. So basal pattern and the surface patterns. And uh, this classification has a four subcategory, type one, two, uh, two, three, and threes. So in summary, uh, if you have a magnifying endoscopy, if you don't have magnifying endoscopy, please use nice classification. But if you have magnifying endoscopy, please use genus classification for better treatment option and for precious diagnosis. Okay, but I know so most of you don't have a magnifying endoscope. So I have a question. So do we really need a magnifying endoscopy itself? So, okay, I'll show you one case. So do you think this lesion is neoplasia or non-neoplasia? So please raise your hand if this lesion is neoplasia. You think neoplasia? Okay, so so the if do you think this lesion is non-neoplasia, raise your hand. Okay, no. Okay, so in my opinion, so there are almost no vessels in these images because this image was taken by NBI without magnifications. But how about this? This is a sample lab, uh, taken by this NBI with magnification. So we can see the thickened vessel on the surface. So I, I will ask you the same questions. So is this polyp neoplasia? Let your hand, neoplasia? Or, okay, non neoplasia? Okay, so I think most of you are correct. This is an adenoma. So I'd like to stress, we can only diagnose what we can see. This is very important. So magnifying endoscopy can make uh, invisible or small findings visible. This is the most important step to diagnose the polyp collectory. Okay, so problem, there is a problem with old magnifying endoscope. So first, adjusting focus was difficult because old magnifying endoscope has a fine operation with a lever. It is very difficult to adjust the focus, but now uh, it is available the one patch and old focus systems called the near focus systems. I'm thinking, so when we use the high magnification endoscopy, so distal area, uh, easily become out of focus. But now, so Olympus new technology EDO system as a full focus system is available. So this, uh, this, this solved this problem. So EDO stands for extended depth of field. So incoming beam split into two parts and so distal focus area and the closed focus images and then fuse the image so it creates the full focus image. So I think there's new scope CF EZ1, 500 scope, and EVS X1. This combination is most powerful and easy magnification system. And this scope has easy autofocus zoom and higher probable magnifications and with full focus system. So anyone can take high quality magnifying images easily. I'll show you videos. Okay, so this is the 50 millimeter in size of Piper legions. 
when we close to the lesions. So we can see the irregular bursas and irregular surface pattern by the query. And the distant area and the cross area, both of them are in focus. So we can easily diagnose this lesion is the general type 2 lesions. Like this. Okay, so magnifying colonoscopy is no longer used only for special cases. So it's time to use it in, in every colonoscopy for every polyp assessment. So this is a take home message for me. To find clues was effective in the detection of high risk fat and blast lesions. And magnification makes small invisible findings to visible, which is the most important step for accurate and confident diagnosis. And thank you for visiting my talks. Okay, that's all I have to say in my talk. Thank you very much, Professor Iwatate. Uh, now we have time for discussion. Any question from audience? Okay. Hello. Hi, Professor Iwadate. Long time to see you. Yes, hi. And I have a uh, thank you for very wonderful speak. And uh, I uh, have one question for you. Yes. As is your video and you know, image, the image quality is really, really sharp and very clear. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we use the same uh, system but we cannot obtain the the best image like your like you perform so do you have any tips to share with us to have uh, the best image like this okay so okay so uh it's important to watch the lesion many times this is the first step to get the best image qualities okay and then so magnification Magnification is the most important to uh, get the best quality image, I think. So please use magnifying endoscopy. But I know you don't have a magnifying scope, so please ask your boss, please buy a new magnifying endoscope when you are uh, looking coronos coronoscope is blocking. Like that? It's okay. Thank you, and uh, I have a second question. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes we use cap distal attachment to reveal the fold, the some less lesions uh, behind the fold. But in uh, your image, uh, uh, we do not follow uh, any uh, distal attachment. And what is your tip to uh, reveal the, the core purpose? Yes, behind the fold, yes. Okay, so I think so. So using attachment is the, I think, better choice uh, to detect the polyp behind the fold. But uh, my boss don't like the using the tips because the image are uh, getting worse. So, but in my opinion, it's better to use the tips for detecting the polyp behind the fold. Okay. Yes, but what is your tip to, uh, to uh, make uh, a bad view of uh, the, the colon surface behind the fold? You okay. Up angle and uh, rotate the scope, right? Yes. So okay. So when there is a polyp uh, in the severe curve, so the pushing scope is sometimes uh, useful to detect the such a very uh, severe curves. Perhaps. So first, they uh, are pushing the scope is very effective and very easy. And of course, the uh, rotate the scope and is also effective. I think. Thank you very much. Ah, thank you, uh, Professor Iwadate. I have a yes. question for you. Uh, yes. If we adapt, find clue. Yes, find clue. Find clue, yeah. Very informative inf uh, lecture. To, uh, to detect the uh, flat and depressed lesion of the colorectal 
uh, it usually take time, longer time, a procedure, a chloroscopy, if we adopt the uh, five clues. So, uh, do you have any experience how to reduce the procedural time if we adopt uh, uh, mm -hmm. in every case of chloroscopy? Thank you. Okay, so uh, in my clinical practice, I don't think it takes time to find the foggy clues, but I routinely uh, do uh, to detect the uh, for kikus, especially so in my opinion, so inflating air is very important to uh, see the best visibility. So I always check the best visibility in the correct mucosa because so the very big polyp of the polyps are easy to catch. So I don't care. But uh, I check the mucosa best visibilities. So always. So this is, I think, very important. And literally, we, we can do, we should do the infrared air and check the best visibilities. So I think this is the uh, most important for uh, every colonoscopy. Uh, but how, how well clean every mucus and stone attachment on the colon, colonic mucosa? We have to clean every, when, whenever we see the still not the mucus attachment on the colonic mucosa. We have to clean and to help, right? Okay, so some water jet function will help you to clean them uh, mucosa stools or something to clear uh, the dirty stool or something. But uh, I think so, there's a stool attachment in the uh, belly, uh, important uh, key clue to detect SSL. So, before washing the uh, mucus or stool, so please check the stool accumulations aspect uh, massively. So this is the key clue. So, okay, so when you see the stool accumulation, so first you think so then is, there may be a SSLs and then washing out and change to NBI or chrome endoscopy and check the SSLs. Thank you, Professor Iwatate. I, I saw three questions in the Q&A box. Can you check it? Okay, Q&A box. So with the, okay, so I'll let it. And with the advance of near focus NBI, when is Kermot's copy with the comment or could spell that be applicable the lesion assessment? Okay, so near focus NBIs. And so is available uh, with integral coming and the crystal ballet also. Both of crystal ballet and uh, integral coming dentists are pre-capable with the near focus functions. It's okay, it's enough, I think. Okay then, so. Is high blade EMO can be an option in the plus lesion. Yes, of course. So if the deepest lesion is small, especially less than 10 millimeter in size, so hybrid EMS or conventional EMS is also acceptable, I think. It's enough. Okay. But so because of both of hybrid EMS and the conventional EMS can resect deeply, so we can get the deep materials 